This anomalous land, this sprawling waste of timber and rock and water, where the only living sounds were the footfalls of animals or the fantastic laughter of a loon. This empty tract of primordial silences and winds and erosions and shifting colors. This bead-like string of crude towns and cities tied by nothing but railway tracks. This nation, undiscovered by the rest of the world and unknown to itself. These people, neither American or English nor even sure what they wanted to be. This unborn mightiness, this question mark, this future for himself, and for God knew how many millions of mankind. Those were the words of Hugh McLennan, words about the country he spent a lifetime trying to define. In trying to root out the place they inhabit, the writers of English Canada are faced not with one landscape, but with many. Theirs is an ever-changing and complicated view, a view which stretches as far as the heart can see, a view into the soul of a nation, a view from the typewriter. William Ormond Mitchell and his grandson, Ty. You, do you ever call me Grandpa? Ty? Never. What do you call me? Your name. Hmm? Bill? W-O? Remember what I told you? If you ever call me Grandpa, what I'd do? What? What did I say I'd do? Bust your jaw. Huh? W.O. Mitchell's view of Canada soared off the page and into the imagination with the publication of his first novel, Who Has Seen the Wind? Here was the least common denominator of nature, the skeleton requirements simply of land and sky, Saskatchewan Prairie. It lay wide around the town stretching tan to the far line of the sky, shimmering under the June sun, and waiting for the unfailing visitation of wind. Gentle at first, barely stroking the long grasses and giving them life. Later, a long, hot gusting that would lift the black topsoil and pile it in barrow pits along the roads or in the deep banks against the fences. The rain had stopped and the air had the clear coolness that belongs to it after rain. Over the prairie, shallow sloughs were filled to their edges. The thirsty earth had drunk up the water and left much of it to lie in clear puddles between the hummocks. Here and there, meadowlarks were suddenly upon straw stacks, telephone wires, fence posts, their song clear with ineffable exuberance that startled and deepened the prairie silence, each quick and impudent climax of notes, leaving behind it a vaster, emptier prairie world. And all about him was the wind, a pervasive sighing through great emptiness, unhampered by the buildings of the town, warm and living against his face and in his hair. From Mitchell's Prairie, across the Rockies and beyond the sea, sits a gentler, greener, but just as confusing landscape, where writer Jack Hodgins developed his view of Vancouver Island. 
Sometimes he believes that he owns this island, that he has perhaps invented it. He expects that he should be able to conjure it up for you out of the thick air above his kitchen table. 12,000 square miles of rugged stone mountain and timber stands, logged off slopes, deep green valleys sprinkled with fishing villages around rotting wharves. Logging camps, tar paper huts on skids, towns and resorts and hobby farms, the snag spiked lakes and long crooked green rivers. In words, if you let him, he will decorate the tree furry coastland with used car lots, rotting hay barns, smoke blooming pulp mills, weedy estuaries, log booming grounds and brand new subdivisions. With old beached freighters painted up for restaurants and rusted wartime destroyers sunk for breakwaters. With mountains of gleaming white shells growing right up out of bays and topped with tiny shacks selling oysters. He will even take credit now for the single gray highway that stretches from the bottom tip two thirds of the way up the eastern coast. And for leaving all the rest to be found by narrow snaking roads designed for logging trucks. And he will act as if he himself had set all this down on the ocean, amidst foamy rocks and other smaller islands where sea lions sunbathe and cormorants nest and stunted trees are bent horizontal from the steady force of the Pacific wind. He touches, he listens, he reads, he worries. He will absorb all this chaos. He will confront it and absorb it. And finally, he will begin to tell, and by telling, release it, make it finally his own. And on the other side of the country, that other ocean, that other island, the outports and the people of Newfoundland, as viewed by Farley Mowat. This is the place where women watch and wait through the interminable night, while the house shivers in the tearing talons of a winter's gale, and the boat is too long overdue. It is the place where people sit in silence, but not alone, while in an upstairs room a pulse flickers fitfully and a heartbeat slows. The outport home rejects no man and no emotion. It accepts all that there is of life and death. It provides a place where those who have outworn their flesh can wait the hours down. Within these walls there is a sustaining certitude that is proof against disaster against hardship, against the darkest hours of adversity, and against loneliness. Here there is a quality to human sharing, and an unspoken understanding that is proof against the very fates themselves. Here there is a unity that has no name, and here there is a quiet at the close. Margaret Lawrence's view from her typewriter was the view down the main street of her childhood home, Nipawa, Manitoba. It was a town she was never really able to leave. In her work, she would turn it into Manawaka, surely the most celebrated prairie town in Canadian writing. A strange place it was, that place where the world began. A place of incredible happenings, splendors and revelations, despairs like multitudinous pits of isolated hells. A place of shadow spookiness, inhabited by the unknowable dead. A place of jubilation and of mourning, horrible and beautiful. It was, in fact, a small prairie town. 
towns like ours, set in a sea of land, have been described thousands of times as dull, bleak, flat, uninteresting. The town of my childhood could be called bizarre, agonizingly repressive or cruel at times, and the land in which it grew could be called harsh in the violence of its seasonal changes, but never merely flat or uninteresting, never dull. This is where my world began, a world which formed me and continues to do so, a world which gave me my own life work to do because it was here that I learned the sight of my own particular eyes. Unlike Lawrence, Farley Mowat's writing would not be centered in his birthplace. Mowat didn't start writing seriously until he'd left small town Ontario and took a job up north, counting wolves for the government. What he wrote about there changed the view that most of us had of that distinct landscape. Across the northern reaches of this continent there lies a mighty wedge of treeless plain, scarred by the primordial ice, inundated beneath a myriad of lakes, cross-checked by innumerable rivers, and riven by the rock bones of an elder earth. It is a land uncircumscribed, for it has no limits that the eye can find. It seems to reach beyond the finite boundaries of this planet, brooding, immutable, given over to its own essential mood of desolation. It showed so bleak a face to the white man who came upon its verges that they named it, in awe and fear, the barren grounds. If the barren grounds were awesome, they were also cruel and unforgiving. The great wind from off the congealed white desert of the Arctic Sea came seeking south across 500 miles of tundra plains. The driven snow scoured the darkness like a blast of sand until no living thing could face it. Nothing ran, nor crawled, nor flew over the broken ridges, the frozen musk eggs, and the faceless hidden lakes. Yet there was life unseen beneath the wind. On the shores of a narrow bay in North Hennick Lake, two snow houses crouched against the implacable violence of the gale, and within their dark confines, people listened to the wind's voice. It sank into the mind like needles into naked flesh. In the smaller of the two houses, there were four people. One of these, the year-old boy Igiaka, lay rigidly inert and did not hear the wind. His small body was shrunken into a macabre travesty of human form by the long hunger which, two days earlier, had given him over to the frost to kill. Many of our writers have explored the geography of the land, but it wasn't until Earl Burney published his magnificent David that the mountains of the West staked their claim on the literary map. The peak was upthrust like a fist in a frozen ocean of rock that swirled into valleys the moon could be rolled in. Remotely unfurling eastward, the alien prairie glittered. Down through the dusty scree on the west we descended. And David showed me how to use the give of shale for giant, incredible strides. I remember, before the larch's edge, that I jumped a long green surf of juniper, flowing away from the wind, and landed in gentian and saxifrage spilled on the moss. Then the darkening firs, and the sudden whirring of water that knifed down a fern-hidden cliff, and splashed unseen into mist, in the shadows. One Sunday on Ramparts Arrayed, 
a rain squall caught us and passed. And we clung by our bluing fingers and boot nails an endless hour in the sun, not daring to move till the ice had steamed from the slate. And David taught me how time on a knife edge can pass, with the guessing of fragments remembered from poets, the naming of strata beside one, and matching of stories from school days. We crawled astride the peak to feast on the marching rangers flagged by the fading shreds of the shattered storm cloud. Lingering there, it was David who spied to the south, remote and unmapped, a sunlit spire on sawback, an overhang crooked like a talon. David named it the Finger. When two ships, the Emo and the Mont Blanc, collided in Halifax Harbor in 1917, it was the largest man-made explosion in the history of the world. 1,600 killed, 9,000 injured, 25,000 homeless. Hugh McLennan was 10 years old when the Halifax explosion became part of our collective history. He would return to it for his first novel, Barometer Rising. A needle of flaming gas, thin as a mast, and of a brilliance unbelievably intense, shot through the deck of the Mont Blanc near the funnel and flashed more than 200 feet toward the sky. The firemen were thrown back, and their hoses jumped suddenly out of control and slashed the air with S-shaped designs. There were a few helpless shots. Then all movement and life about the ship were encompassed in a sound beyond hearing as the Mont Blanc opened up. When the shock struck the earth, the rigid iron stone and granite base of Halifax Peninsula rocked and reverberated. Pavements split, houses swayed as the earth trembled. The atmosphere went white hot. It grew mottled, then fell to the streets like a crimson curtain. The Halifax explosion was seen, recorded, written down, and through that process became a part of our story. Other tragedies in other parts of the country would also go into the building of our literature and our character. This is how W.O. Mitchell viewed the Great Depression of the 1930s. The town showed the depression Houses needed paint. Cars on First Street Saturday evenings were older models. Plate glass windows were empty where businesses had left. The McDougal Implement Company was the only one of three implement firms remaining. The sash and door factory closed down. Blaine's General Store failed. The land was dotted now with empty farmhouses their blank windows staring out over the spreading prairie, their walls piled high with rippled banks of black dust. Farmers and their families moved westward and northward to Alberta and the Peace River country. Freights were covered with unemployed, many of them young boys who had never had jobs in their lives, who had left the East to find work in the West, or the West to find work in the East. <laughs> And in other times, other memories. The news of Dieppe changes the town of Manawaka. It will never be the same again. Not until this moment has the war been a reality here. Now it is a reality. There are many dead who will not be buried in the Manawaka Cemetery up on the hill, where the tall spruces stand like dark angels. There are a great many families who now have fewer sons or none. 
The newspapers for days are full of stories of bravery, courage, camaraderie, initiative, heroism, gallantry, and determination in the face of heavy enemy fire. Are any of the stories true? Probably it does not matter. They may console some. What is a true story? Is there any such thing? The only truth at the moment seems to be in the long lists of the dead. The only certainty is that they are dead forever and ever and ever. writers have given us is more than a view of the geography and the history of this country. They have helped define who we are. But in a country so diverse, so spread out, who we are is often a bewildering collection of different legends and ancestry, each section of the country carrying its own cultural baggage. Here, for instance, are Hugh McLennan's Canadians from his Cape Breton novel, each man's son. A desperate and poetic people. They were a race of hunters, shepherds, and warriors who had discovered too late that their own courage and pride had led them to catastrophe. Since it had enabled them to resist the Saxon civilization so long, they had come to the end of the 18th century knowing nothing of the foreman, the boss, the politician, the policeman, the merchant, or the buyer and seller of other men's work. When the English set out to destroy the clans of Scotland, the most independent of the Highlanders left their homes with the pipes playing laments on the decks of their ships. They crossed the ocean and the pipes played again when they waded ashore on the rocky coast of Cape Breton Island. There they rooted themselves. Big men from the red-haired parts of the Scottish main and dark-haired smaller men from the Hebrides. Women from the mainland with strong bones and Hebridean women with delicate skins, accepting eyes and a musical sadness in their speech. They brought with them an ancient curse, intensified by John Calvin and branded upon their souls by John Knox and his successors. The belief that man has inherited from Adam a nature so sinful there is no hope for him and that furthermore, he lives and dies under the wrath of an arbitrary God who will forgive only a handful of his elect on the day of judgment. The people who populate Jack Hodgson's work share a different history, a different background. Yet here too is an integral part of who we are and what we want to be. One of the problems was that he came from an up island family who all appeared to have more energy than they knew what to do with. Their purpose in life, it seemed to him as a boy, was simply to burn up as much of it as they could as fast as possible. Work, work, work. They were all scared to stop in case all that energy should pile up unused and overwhelm them. His father worked all day on the mountains as a second loader for the logging company, and drove the crummy besides. And once he got home, he came inside the house only long enough to gulp his supper before going outside again to work on what he called his stump ranch. In the evenings, he cleared field after field out in the bush with a homemade pieced together tractor, cutting, hauling, blasting, burning, and planting. He did not want to be a logger. He did not want to be a teacher not want to be a soldier. If anyone had asked him what he wanted to be when he grew up, 
in a way that meant they expected the truth. He'd have said quite simply that he wanted to be a Finn. But being a Finn meant something very specific. A Finn would give you the shirt off his back. A Finn was as honest as the day is long. A Finn could drink anybody onto the table and beat up half a dozen Germans and Irishmen without even trying. A Finn was not afraid of work. The Finnish girls were blonde and beautiful and flirtatious. The Finnish boys were strong, brave, and incredibly intelligent. Larry Kerhonen, who was a teenager, told him he was actually Superman, having learned to fly after long hours of practice off their barn roof. He decided his ambition in life was to be a fan. Across the strait from Vancouver Island, the city of Vancouver, home during the 1940s to the unheralded genius of Malcolm Lowry. Suppose you land in Vancouver. It has a sort of pango-pango quality mingled with sausage and mash and generally a rather Puritan atmosphere. Everyone is fast asleep, and when you prick them, a Union Jack flows out of the hole. But no one, in a certain sense, lives there. They merely, as it were, pass through, mine the country, and quit. Blast the land to pieces, knock down the trees, and send them rolling down Barad Inlet. As for drinking, by the way, that is beset, everywhere beset, by perhaps favorable difficulties. No bars, only beer parlors so uncomfortable and cold, that served beer so weak, no self-respecting drunkard would show his nose in them. You have to drink at home, and when you run short, it's too far to get a bottle. While Lowry struggled with the charms of BC beer parlors, other writers were starting to deal with their own priorities. A young Leonard Cohen wrote of growing up in the rich Montreal suburb of Westmount. Just beyond the green rose the large stone houses of Westmount Avenue. In them, the baseball players were growing their bodies with sleep, resting their voices. He imagined that he could see them dimly through the walls of the upper stories, or rather the sheets they were wrapped in, floating row upon row over the street, like a colony of cocoons in a moonlit tree. The young men of his age, Christian and blonde, dreaming of Jewish sex, and bank careers. Here is a movie filled with the bodies of his family. His father aims the camera at his uncles, tall and serious boutonnieres in their dark lapels, who walk too close and enter into blurdom. Now the boy and his cousins fight small gentlemanly battles. The girls curtsy. All the children are invited to leap one at a time across the flagstone path. A battalion of wives is squeezed abreast, is decimated by the edge of the screen. His mother is one of the first to go. The memories of childhood were all different, and yet they were all the same. The small histories of our writers became the small histories of our country. For once upon a time, every town had a Roxy, and every girl a moment like this. The Roxy Theater has never been a theater, as far as I know, except for the occasional minstrel show years ago, put on for the Red Cross or some deserving cause. The first time I ever went to a movie with a boy, I was 15. The adult price wasn't charged until 16. The boy was 16. I stood beside him, obsessed with one thought. How would I ever walk past the ticket girl and face the usherette if he bought a child's ticket for me? 
He didn't, of course, so I'd upset myself needlessly. When Hugh McLennan started his teaching career in a private boys' school in Montreal, he was the first native-born Canadian to teach there. A generation or so later, Lower Canada College has more Canadian-born teachers, but it still carries on in much the same old way. Bow your heads for grace, please. For what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. <laughs> It was still an upper-class school, though not exactly aristocratic. Such snobbishness as it may have had was not conscious. It was simply an English-style school run for the sons of prosperous Canadians. The masters were all Englishmen, and most of them were young. They came out from England every fall and worked for a few years before drifting off into other jobs or other schools. The few who remained tended to become characters, each with his recognized set of mannerisms. They taught the boys British history and geography, and they even tried to teach them British manners as well. This never quite succeeded. The boys knew all the latest American slang and used it. They played better baseball than cricket. In October, when the World Series was played, a surreptitious betting pool generally operated in the basement. of Jack Hodgins' boyhood were quite different from the reality of Lower Canada College. But then sometimes reality and fiction have a way of coming together on Vancouver Island. Uh, my name is Frank Ney. I'm the mayor of the city of Nanaimo. And this is the oldest Empire Day parade in the British Commonwealth, 114 years. What a wonderful day, a happy day here in the city of Nanaimo on the Blue Pacific. Nanaimo, Jewel of the West, Sunport, Canada, the bathtub capital of the world, and loyal to the Commonwealth. A happy day for everybody. Have a good weekend, everybody. Have a good weekend. Pay your taxes and time on. This is the way Hodgins deals with the sprawling urbanization of the island, seen through the eyes of a fictional politician, desperate to bring his logging town into the big time. It drove the mayor crazy, but no one had ever heard of the town. It made him furious when year after year no real tourists ever came to visit. Would he ever get a chance to try out that smile? Tourists were pouring into every other town in the province, he was sure. There was no reason for them to come here. In the first place, because the town still hadn't come up with a spectacular tourist attraction to make that long, uncomfortable trip worthwhile. Lord knows he'd tried hard enough to get people off their backsides for a change. His imagination had come up with a wealth of schemes. Just try to get anyone to put out any energy in this town. Well, how about the world's biggest beer drinking contest? Well, then, what about Christy Jimmy? Couldn't he throw up a couple of longhouses or something in the bush and charge people to go through an authentic Indian village? He could wrap himself in a blanket, tell stories. The more far-fetched, the better. The tourists would love it. He offered to finance Ian McCarthy. If only he'd throw up a fence around 10 acres of bush and put up a sign calling it the Magical Forest. Are you kidding? was Ian's reply. By the time he gets here, the poor bugger is already driven through 150 miles of the real boring thing. The only scheme I ever had any hope of getting off the ground was the world's biggest slug race, an international event. Now, someone higher up in the mill had turned thumbs down on the deal, too undignified. Doesn't it drive you crazy that we haven't a single fast food outlet, nowhere to get a quick hamburger like everybody else? Doesn't it make you mad that to buy a new car you have to drive the old one 150 miles to find it? Well, here's your chance. You'll take it. A dozen used car lots right in your doorstep before you know it. 
dozen hamburger drive-ins along the highway with golden arches and rotating buckets and neon lights as far as the eye can see. Just let them build a resort and all of civilization will follow. You wonder how you ever stood it before. In the more refined world of Ontario cottage country, the simple building of a dock becomes another quintessential part of the Canadian experience. Margaret Atwood. My father looks at this dock, his eyes narrowing in calculation, his fingers itching and sees mainly that it needs to be repaired. The winter ice has been at it, the sun, the rain. It is patched and treacherous. Threads of rot are spreading through it. Sometime soon he will take his crowbar to it, rip apart its punky and dangerous boards and the logs excavated by nesting yellow jackets, and rebuild the whole thing new. My mother sees it as a place from which to launch canoes and as a handy repository for soap and towel, when about three in the afternoon, in the lull between the lunch dishes and reactivating the fire for supper, she goes swimming. Okay. Into the gelid, heart-stoppingly cold water she wades, over the blackened pine needles lying on the sand and the waterlogged branches, over the shells of clams and the carapaces of crayfish, splashing the tops of her arms until she finally plunges in and speeds outward on her back, her neck coming straight up out of the water like an otter's, her head in its white bathing cap encircled by an aureole of black flies, kicking up a small white behind her and uttering cries of refreshing, refreshing. the writer's main gift is the ability to take us places we might never visit, to experience events we could never attend, to be invited, for instance, to an Up Island wedding party, courtesy of Jack Hodgins. The second hour of the wedding, instead of speeches and dancing, was spent in what was later called the best damn brawl the island had ever seen. The first words at the battle were Herbie Perkis's. That's my wife. The second were Danny Holland's. That's your fault, not mine. The first blow of the battle was struck by the red-faced wife. She stepped through the newly cut doorway, slapped her husband's face. Go get him, she cried, you coward. Go get the crummy bastard. The second blow of the battle was not struck by Herbie Perkis, nor by Mrs. Perkis, nor was it struck by Danny Holland, whose chainsaw idled at his side. The second blow of the battle was struck by Maggie Kyle Powers, who let out one of her famous hoots, stood up on the bride's table, and threw the top layer of her cake straight at Danny Holland's head, but missed. She began to shout out that this was going to be one wedding that wouldn't end in a brawl, that she expected everyone to act like proper society, and her husband and she both wanted them to have a good time without resorting to violence. But her throwing of the cake was vastly misinterpreted. And while she was making her position clear, the crowd, who could not hear her, was shouting, "At a girl, Maggie, and go get him, girl. And there's the old spirit again. And Christ Almighty, this is more like it. If the bride could throw cake, they understood. The least they could do was throw dishes and furniture. Our writers also take us places where we are less comfortable, take us into the minds and hearts of fictional characters who help us through the tough times, who become what we will become. Like the wonderful Hager Shipley from Margaret Lawrence's The Stone Angel. 
Oh, I was the one all right, tossing my black mane contemptuously, yet never certain the young men had really noticed. I knew my mind, no doubt, but the mind changed every minute. One instant feeling pleased with what I knew and who I was and where I lived, the next instant consigning the brick house to perdition and seeing the plain board town and the shack dwellings beyond as though they'd been the beckoning illustrations in the book of Slavic fairy tales given me by an aunt. Do you get used to life? Can you answer me that? It all comes as a surprise. You get your first period and you're amazed. I can have babies now, such a thing. When the children come, you think, is it mine? Did it come out of me? Who could believe it? When you can't have them anymore, what a shock. It's finished so soon. Wherever we look, the view becomes specifically our own. And on Prince Edward Island, when the rain comes, it is not a rain that belongs to any other place. This is a special rain, poet Milton Acorn's rain. Take a rain trip. Neither swallow it or smoke it. But stand out in the rain in shorts, a loincloth or naked with every aperture of your body open and your thoughts a bubble from horizon to horizon. Think a while and the clouds will be giant spiders with every raindrop through all the time of its course a leg. These are million-legged spiders with every contradictory current of the air bending each one of the millions of legs in hazardous courses so they dance. Get the cool of it, the chance taste of drops that open bellied wind throws at you. Sometimes the view from the typewriter gets clearer the further away the writer is from home. And looking back, it also seems that the view rarely changes, that the headlines of 30 years ago are, amazingly, the headlines of today. Leonard Cohen wrote this poem in Cuba in 1961. Come, my brothers, let us govern Canada. Let us find our serious heads. Let us dump asbestos on the White House. Let us make the French talk English, not only here, but everywhere. <laughs> Let us torture the Senate individually <laughs> until they confess. Let us purge the new party. Let us encourage the dark races so they'll be lenient when they take over. <laughs> Let us make the CBC talk English. Let us all lean in one direction and float down to the coast of Florida. Let us have two governor generals at the same time. Let us have another official language. Let us determine what it will be. Let us give a Canada Council fellowship to the most original suggestion. Let us teach sex in the home to parents. Let us threaten to join the USA and pull out at the last moment. <laughs> My brothers, come. Our serious heads are waiting for us somewhere, like Gladstone bags abandoned after a coup d'etat. Let us put them on very quickly. Let us maintain a stony silence on the St. Lawrence Seaway. <laughs> Thank you.
But perhaps the last word should go to Hugh McLennan, for it was his second novel, published nearly half a century ago, which still seems to sum up a large part of the Canada we share. The novel was Two Solitudes, a title which became part of our political and cultural language. McLennan took the phrase from a letter from the German poet Rilke, who was attempting to define love, not a bad thought for a country as bewildering as ours. For love consists in this, that two solitudes will protect and define and greet each other. The trouble with this whole country is that it is divided up into little puddles with big fish in each one of them. This country is so new that when you see it for the first time, all of it, and particularly the West, you feel like Columbus and you say to yourself, my God, is all this ours? Then you make the trip back. You come across Ontario and you encounter the mind of the maiden art. You see the Methodists in Toronto and the Presbyterians in the best streets of Montreal and the Catholics all over Quebec. And nobody understands one damn thing except that he's better than everyone else. The French are Frencher than France, and the English are more British than England ever dared to be. In Montreal, two old races and religions meet and live their separate legends side by side. If this sprawling half-continent has a heart, here it is. Its pulse throbs out along the rivers and railroads, slow, reluctant, and rarely simple, a double beat, a self-moved reciprocation. Two solitudes in the infinite waste of loneliness under the sun.